Hello, and welcome to the new module Scrum Aspects under the framework of SBOT Guide. Previously, we saw the key principles of Scrum in detail. This module will introduce you to the various aspects of Scrum, which must all be addressed and managed through a Scrum project. The five Scrum aspects that we will discuss in this module are organization, business justification, quality, change, and risk. In the SBOT guide, all five Scrum aspects are presented in chapters 3 through 7. We will be discussing all of them one by one, but let's first start with the very first aspect, organization. For now, let's keep the key concepts under the organization aside and try to understand the defined roles and responsibilities in a Scrum project. Why? Because defined roles and responsibilities ensures the successful implementation of Scrum. Evidently, Scrum roles fall into two broad categories, core roles and non-core roles. Core roles are those that are involved in producing the project's product or service. Individuals who are assigned core roles are fully committed to the project. They are ultimately responsible for the success of each project iteration and of the project as a whole. Core roles are assigned to the product owner, Scrum Master, and the Scrum Team. Now that we have seen that there are a few inevitable names associated with the core roles, let's meet them one by one and see what they do in a Scrum-controlled project. First, we have the product owner, who is the person responsible for achieving maximum business value for the project. He or she is also responsible for articulating customer requirements and maintaining business justification for the project. The product owner represents the voice of the customer. Next is the Scrum Master. The Scrum Master is a facilitator who ensures that the Scrum team is provided with an environment conducive to completing the project successfully. The Scrum Master guides, facilitates, and teaches Scrum practices to everyone involved in the project. The Scrum Master clears impediments for the team and ensures that all the Scrum processes are being followed. To clarify, here's an example. This is ABC Corporation. The software development team at ABC is facing roadblocks lately. Why? Well, it seems that they are unable to live up to the set standards of a project in terms of quality. What is the stumbling block here? Lack of expertise required for the project. It, in turn, leads to delay. So this is where the Scrum Master is going to pitch in. How is he or she going to do that? First of all, the task of the Scrum Master will be to focus on finding ways to clear the impediment, which comes in the form of lack of expertise required for the project. How is this possible? Well, the Scrum Master at this juncture is either going to raise an immediate requirement for hiring software developers with required expertise, or he can make an arrangement for training the existing staff. The Scrum Master will now make a decision based on the cost-effectiveness and time consumption of the action to be taken. Finally, it's now the turn of the Scrum Team. They actually do the work. The Scrum Team is the group or team of people who are responsible for understanding the requirements specified by the product owner and creating the deliverables of the project. So, considering the earlier example, the software development team, either with newly recruited experts or with newly acquired training, will proceed in accordance with the requirements set by the product owner. Now, let's take a closer look at the non-core roles. The non-core roles are optional and may include all team members who are interested in the project. They have no formal role in the project team, but they may interface with the team. However, they may not be responsible for the success of the project. The non-core roles should be taken into account in any Scrum project. So, who is involved in non-core roles? Stakeholders, the Scrum Guidance Body, Vendors, the Chief Product Owner, and the Chief Scrum Master. Let's meet these people one by one. The first role is the stakeholder or stakeholders. This is a collective term that includes customers, users, and sponsors. They frequently communicate with the Scrum core team and influence the project throughout the project's development. Most importantly, it is for the stakeholders that the project produces the collaborative benefits. Second is the Scrum guidance body, which is also referred to as the SGB. It is an optional role consisting of a set of documents 
or a group of experts, typically involved in defining objectives related to quality, government regulations, security, and other key organizational parameters. This Scrum guidance body guides the work carried out by product owner, Scrum master, and Scrum team. The next non-core role is played by the vendors. They include external individuals or internal organizations that provide products or services that are not within the core competencies of the project organization. The chief product owner is another non-core role. This role is relevant for large projects that have multiple Scrum teams. The chief product owner is responsible for coordinating the work of multiple product owners. The last non-core role is the chief Scrum master, who is responsible for coordinating Scrum-related activities in large projects that may require multiple Scrum teams to work in parallel. Now to help you understand how the Scrum organizational structure works, we have a diagram here. The roles played by the Scrum Master, Product Owner, Scrum Team, and the interrelation of these roles, and the way in which each one of them contributes to fulfilling customer requirements, are summarized here. The organization aspect of Scrum also addresses the team structure requirements to implement Scrum in programs and portfolios. So now that we have seen the core and non-core roles played in a Scrum-controlled project, let's now discuss another key Scrum aspect, business justification. It's important for an organization to perform a proper business assessment prior to starting any project. This helps the key decision makers understand the business need for change or for a new product or service, the justification for moving forward with a project, and its viability. Business justification in Scrum is based on the concept of value-driven delivery. One of the key characteristics of any project is the uncertainty of results or outcomes. It is impossible to guarantee project success at completion, regardless of the size or complexity of a project. Considering this uncertainty of achieving success, Scrum attempts to start delivering results as early in the project as possible. This early delivery of results, and thereby value, provides an opportunity for reinvestment and proves the worth of the project to interested stakeholders. Furthermore, Scrum's adaptability allows the project's objectives and processes to change if its business justification changes. It is important to note that although the product owner is primarily responsible for business justification, other team members also contribute significantly. So far, we have seen two important Scrum aspects. Quality is the third aspect we are going to discuss now. In Scrum, quality is defined as the ability of the completed product or deliverables to meet the acceptance criteria and achieve the business value expected by the customer. To ensure that a project meets its quality requirements, Scrum adopts an approach of continuous improvement, whereby the team learns from experience and stakeholder engagement to constantly keep the prioritized product backlog updated with any changes in requirements. The prioritized product backlog is simply never complete until the closure or termination of the project. Moreover, any changes to the requirements reflect changes in the internal and external business environment and allow the team to continually work and adapt to achieve those requirements. Through repetitive testing, Scrum requires work to be completed incrementally through sprints, rather than waiting until the end to produce deliverables. This means that errors get fixed right away, instead of being postponed until the end of the project. Moreover, important quality-related tasks, for example, development, testing, and documentation, are completed as part of the same sprint by the same team. This ensures that quality is inherent in any deliverable created as part of a sprint. Such deliverables from Scrum projects which are potentially shippable, are also referred to as done. For example, if internal customers are not happy with a product delivered in terms of quality, the issues can be listed in the prioritized product backlog. These kinds of issues will be addressed during the sprints, and the team will try to fix them so that quality is not compromised. Thus, continuous improvement with repetitive testing optimizes the probability of achieving the expected quality levels in a Scrum project. Constant discussions between the Scrum core team and stakeholders, including customers and users, with actual increments of the product being delivered at the end of every sprint, 
ensures that the gap between customer expectations from the project and actual deliverables produced is constantly reduced. The Scrum guidance body may also provide guidelines about quality, which may be relevant to all Scrum projects in the organization. The next aspect that we're going to discuss here is change, another very important aspect of Scrum. Every project, regardless of its method or framework used, is exposed to change. It is imperative that project team members understand that the Scrum development processes are designed to embrace change. Organizations should try to maximize the benefits that arise from change and minimize any negative impacts through diligent change management processes in accordance with the principles of Scrum. A primary principle of Scrum is its acknowledgement, which are as follows. First, stakeholders, for example, customers, users, and sponsors, change their minds about what they want and need throughout a project, which is sometimes referred to as requirements churn. Second, it is very difficult, if not impossible, for stakeholders to define all requirements during project initiation. Scrum projects welcome change by using short, iterative sprints that incorporate customer feedback on each sprint's deliverables. This enables the customer to regularly interact with the Scrum team members, view deliverables as they're ready, and change requirements, if needed, earlier in the sprint. Also, the portfolio or program management teams can respond to change requests pertaining to Scrum projects applicable at their level. Let's now look at the last Scrum aspect, which is risk. What is risk, and how do you define it? Risk is defined as an uncertain event or set of events that can affect the objectives of a project and may contribute to its success or failure. Risks that are likely to have a positive impact on the project are referred to as opportunities, whereas threats are risks that could affect the project in a negative manner. For example, consider a situation in which one of the key investors in a project backs off at a prime moment. This is a risk affecting the project in a negative way. However, if the project finds a better investor willing to invest in a bigger and better way, it can be considered as an opportunity. Managing risk must be done proactively. It is an iterative process that should begin at project initiation and continue throughout the project's life cycle. The process of managing risks should follow some standardized steps to ensure that risks are identified and evaluated and that a proper course of action is determined and acted upon accordingly. Risks should be identified, assessed, and responded to on the basis of two factors. These are the probability of each risk's occurrence and the possible impact in the event of such an occurrence. Risks with a high probability and impact value are determined by multiplying both factors, and they should be addressed before those with a relatively lower value. In general, once a risk is identified, it is important to understand the risk with regard to the probable causes and the potential effects if the risk occurs. And with that, we conclude our module on Scrum Aspects. I hope this segment was insightful and suggestive of the main aspects of the Scrum framework. I look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you for learning with us.